You know, I get kind of annoyed when I have when I feel compelled to make videos like this because in general, you know, I try to remain positive for the most part and I try to remain kind of cold, calculated and neutral by and large, just very analytical and just looking at the facts and the the figures um, you know, and then just kind of allowing that to basically direct exactly where my opinion or where my my thoughts about a given subject, a given fighter, are going to go. But, I mean, this is something I've been kind of um, thinking about for a little while. And originally, I really didn't want to make the video, but I figured, you know what, screw it. Um... Uh, my man uh, B Marsh kind of inspired this because he kind of got me started thinking and talking about the idea of pound for pound and who belongs. Not necessarily just number one, but you know beyond number one, the one, two through five, all the way through ten, and so on. And I made a video um, a few months back talking about Nai Inoue. And how I felt like he wasn't necessarily being given the, the respect and the props that I felt he was due. And really, I still think that's the case. Now, granted, a lot of that has to do with the fact that he hasn't fought in the United States yet. He hasn't made his American debut yet. And I do know that that is in the works at the moment. I do know that they're you know planning and um, trying to see what they can do with regards to getting him over to the United States, you know, to apply his trade over here and potentially set up a, a nice rivalry between him and the likes of Roman Gonzalez and Juan Francisco Estrada, who are likely to be moving up into his weight class, 115 pounds. But one thing that needs to be understood is the fact that 115 pounds is his second weight class. This is a man who... In just 10 fights, technically just 9 fights, um, he's had 10 fights now because he had his first, def his, um, or rather, um, in 8 fights, excuse me, in 8 fights, because he's had 10 fights, he's had um, 2 defenses since he initially won his title over Omar Narvaez. He's won world championship titles in 2 weight classes, across 3 weight classes. He won a world title at 108 pounds against one of the, the the top fighters in the division, Adrian Hernandez. In only a sixth fight, he won that fight by knockout, by a dominant knockout. He he won every single round up until the sixth round where he TKO'd him. He then made a successful first defense of his title by another dominant knockout, a fight where he basically didn't lose a single round, maybe not even a single second of that fight. He then jumped completely over 112 pounds. Some call it a duck um, to Gonzalez and um, Estrada. Uh, I'd say it's more having to do with, um, you know, part of it is uh, comfort and weight. And then part of it is daring to be great. And in the daring to be great fashion, he moved up to 115 and fought the number one fighter at the weight class. The number one champion at the weight class. WBO super flyweight champion Omar Narvaez and there's nothing and there's there's really no disputing that at the time Omar Narvaez was the man at 115 pounds his only loss previous to that fight was his bout with Nonito Donaire which was a 12 round decision for Donaire which was actually one of Donaire's toughest fights one of his absolutely absolute toughest fights it was a fight where a lot of the fans that were there to see Donaire, because, you know, Narvaez being from Argentina really doesn't have a whole hell of a lot of fans in Southern California where the fight took place. Um, it's, you know, they, they, they were booing him. They were booing Donaire because they went in there expecting him to do a Fernando Montiel to Narvaez. They expected him to go in there, knock out the smaller man coming up in weight, 115 to 118 pounds. Narvaez is a, a former flyweight champion as well. And Donaire didn't pull off the job. Matter of fact, Donaire complained vociferously after the fight about Narvaez, quote-unquote, running. And I'm sure that sounds familiar to a lot of you guys with regards to, you know, fighters complaining about other fighters running. When it's really just a matter of them not being able to apply their skills and abilities in a fashion that 
negates the defensive mastery of their opponent. The defensive mastery, the defensive skills, what have you, the, the, the survivability of their opponents. There's been plenty of fighters who were good defensive fighters that got tracked down, chased down, and roughed up. And that's happened on a number of occasions. Abner Mars versus Antonio Moreno. Um, came close with Alfredo Angulo and Ersland Lilara. Uh, happened, I think, probably in one of the best fashions most recently, Byron Rojas versus Hickey Butler. Um, guys who just got completely swarmed and their defensive skills just weren't necessarily up to the task of a, of just an, uh, a strong, powerful, high stamina, high volume fighter that just came at them nonstop and um, and proved that a certain level of um, I don't even necessarily want to say crudeness, but a certain level of uh, just um, indignation and uh, and tenacity to go out there and dare to be great, to go out there and risk getting hit with clean flush shots by the superior defensive counterpunching opponent, to risk getting potentially blindsided by one of those shots and knocked out, and going out there and you know giving it their all, giving them the business, and coming home with the title. But in any case, Donaire had a very tough fight against Norvaez, and I'd say a lot of those spots... Um, really were kind of the precursor to Guillermo Regendau eventually defeating Nonita Denaire. He used basically the same style, albeit with better timing, a little bit better movement, a um, little more speed, and better reach, certainly, than uh, Narvaez had. Therefore, he could um, get away with a little bit more, and um, he was able to uh, actually defeat Denaire, where Narvaez pretty much just kind of spoiled him and uh, made him look bad, as opposed to actually winning the fight. Now, you know, I didn't have that problem. Went in there, dropped them twice in the first round. Um, I think it was twice in the first round, if I remember correctly. Hurt him badly in the second round and finished him off in that exact same round. And, I mean, it was just a sheer, complete, classic destruction of a top fighter. You know, you have a guy who's maybe, at the time, rated number three, number two at 108 pounds, jumping two weight classes. Or for you know some of you guys that feel like the the differences in weight between 105, 108, 112, etc. are too small between you know a full weight class really you know seven pounds. He went up there and completely annihilated the guy you know in a fashion that you you really don't see that often where a guy is moving up in weight not even just one weight class but he did it you know two weight classes. Um, you know, Adrian Broner, when he jumped from lightweight to welterweight, he didn't destroy Pauli Malinaji like that. And I do remember after the DeMarco fight, Adrian Broner being rated pretty high up in the pound for pound rankings, number six, number seven ish, if not a little bit higher. But, you know, he definitely deserved it at the time. And, um, you know, he's, he's fallen by the wayside, um, in large part since then due to a various number of factors, but. See, here's the thing. I mean, just night in a way, he he pulled off something pretty damn amazing. He won two world class, won two world championships across three weight classes, and did it in only eight fights. Seven of those by knockout. One, the the only guy that he didn't knock out is became a champion after the fact and is still a champion right now. Ryori Chitaguchi, who's, uh, I'd say, maybe the number two, number three fighter at 108 pounds now. Most likely number two, by virtue of uh, who he's beat recently. And, I mean, realistically speaking, in terms of um, if he was to fight the guy that's really number one, Donny Nietes, I think he stands an excellent shot at defeating Donny Nietes. He's a very good fighter. But, in any case... Um, Inoue proved that he can beat a guy that could go on to become great, a guy that was already great in Adrian Hernandez, and a guy who had um, a long history of greatness in Omar Narvaez, a guy who had never been done anything close to that before. So, I mean, just, um, you know, in eight, in eight title fights, or in eight fights, rather, to two weight titles across three weight divisions. Now, this brings me to Vasil Lomachenko. 
who has, according to BoxRec and according to a lot of the mainstream press surrounding boxing, has managed to break that record, becoming a two world a two weight world champion in seven fights. But but a lot of them don't necessarily tell you what I would expect somebody like Dan Raphael of ESPN to tell you because he's a very, very big supporter of Fight Facts. Fight Facts being technically the official record keeper for professional boxing. Vasyl Lomachenko had six fights in the World Series of Boxing. The World Series of Boxing count as professional fights. They use professional rules. Rules are slightly different. Uh, gloves, a little bit of a different size, different padding. Um, the uniform is uh, the uniform with regards to the gloves and the the dress, the attire of the fighters, is um, more strictly controlled compared to the pros. But regardless, technically speaking, Lomachenko didn't win his, according to Fight Facts anyway, Lomachenko didn't win his first title until his seventh fight, or until his eighth fight rather, and he didn't win his second world championship in the second weight class until his 13th fight but from what I recall I don't really seem to remember too many press outlets too many articles about Nai Inoue breaking that record setting the record for fewest number of fights to become a two weight world champion having defeated the number one fighter at the weight class where he won his second world title. But with Vasyl Lomachenko, he's getting just um, unbelievable accolades from just about every press outlet. People talking about him making history. Making history according to BoxRec. Not so much according to Fight Facts. And, you know, making history against... Maybe the number three, maybe the number four, maybe the number five fighter at 130 pounds at the time in Roman Martinez. Last I remember, the top two fighters up until last year at 130 pounds was Takashi Uchiyama and Takashi Miura. Takashi Miura, of course, got defeated and knocked out by Francisco Vargas who, of course, drew with the man that beat Lomachenko in Orlando Salido. And yet uh, Lomachenko gets a pound-for-pound -pound rating and Vargas doesn't. Salido doesn't. The number one fighter, Takashi Uchiyama, got brutally knocked out in two rounds. Two rounds by Jezra Corrales. But Jezra Corrales doesn't get a pound-for-pound -pound rating? Hmm. Uh, you know, it's really um it's really frustrating to see kind of uh the, the, the degree of proliferated bias and ignorance that gets spread around the boxing media and uh the boxing press who you know they, they purport to be unbiased, they purport to be fair, balanced, you know, like Fox News, ironically. <laughs> But, like Fox News, they're anything but. And they have a very um, location-centric view about who deserves what accolades, who deserves what kind of press, and whose achievements are actually worth the time to spread the knowledge and deeper understanding about. And it's, frankly, it's it's just really frustrating to see so many just kind of fall into place. Just, um, you know, take the word as gospel and not try to analyze deeper into the sport that a lot of people try to say or they uh, purport to say that they follow or they love it or that they're experts in. And, it's, and really, if you're supposed to be an expert in the sport, if you're an analyst in the sport, if you're a professional that gets paid to cover the sport, you're derelict in your duty if you're not telling the whole story and the whole truth. 
That's it.